We just had a great panel, and I hope our panel will be as good. Uh, I'm Penina Lahav. I'm, the, uh, I'm on the faculty here at Boston University. I want to thank all of you very much for coming here on a Saturday morning, and uh, particularly thank Linda McLean, who did such a great job organizing uh, everyone here, and also to thank the organizing committee for uh, putting together this conference and our dean, who was so supportive. Uh, now, um, Linda asked me, uh, Linda told me that a chair may either comment on the papers or give her own paper. I decided to give my own paper. Uh, so I will, uh, we will do uh, the um, uh, speaking by the order that it appears on the uh, program, and I will begin. Uh, let me just um, a, um, attend to logistics uh, for a second. Um, we are going to each speak for 10 minutes and then we will have a discussion. Um, and the presenters will be myself, a professor of law here at the law school, Professor Marianne Case, who is on the faculty of the University of Chicago Law School, Professor Shahla Haeri, who is a professor of anthropology at the uh, Department of Anthropology here at Boston University, and is also a legal anthropologist, was the first director of the Women's Studies Program, at Boston University. We have uh, Fenula Ni Eloin. Uh, I learned that Ni means daughter in Gaelic, and Eloin means of the place, so it's the daughter from the place of Eloin, as I understand it, which is very beautiful. And I finally, once I understand what it's about, it's easier for me to remember it. Uh, and Fenula is on the faculty of the University of Minnesota Law School, and she's uh, also visiting at Harvard Law School uh, this year. And Julie Souk, last but not least, uh, Julie is a member of the faculty of the Cardozo Law School and also uh, visiting at Harvard Law School uh, this year. The first three papers, let me tell you, are uh, basically about law and religion, particularly religious law, um, and uh, that is uh, Judaism, Catholicism, and Islam. And uh, Marianne Case pointed out to me that this goes by historical <laughs> sequence, uh, first came the Jews, then the Christians, then the Muslims, and then uh, the last two papers basically address 21st century developments in international law and in European law. So my paper, uh, let me begin with a story. Um, this story took place in the south of Israel in the year 2011, not a long time ago. A woman by the name of Rosie Davidian came to bury her father. She arrived at the cemetery with her family and informed the rabbi that she intended to deliver the eulogy for her dead father. In Israel, matters of church and state are quite entangled. The state provides burial services uh, at a low cost, but with a few exceptions, these services are delivered by a religious institution, the Burial Society. So Rosie had to secure the rabbi's cooperation if she wanted to deliver the eulogy. All members of the family agreed that Rosie was their spokesperson, and all were content to see Rosie deliver the eulogy. In a sense, this reflects, if not the end of men, then at least the rise of women, as independent and powerful enough to take over roles traditionally played by the male members of the family. The officiating rabbi, however, refused to let Rosie deliver the eulogy. He, the, he believed that Jewish law prohibits the participation of females in the uh, funeral process. In the stormy argument that followed, as the dead person was lying there, um, in the stormy argument that followed, the rabbi offered to read the eulogy himself. But Rosie could not accept the fact that her departing words to her father would be read by anyone by her, but herself. She was certainly insistent on her agency in the burial process. The rabbi also insisted that consistent with Jewish law and custom, uh, the women should not only keep quiet, but also walk at the end of the uh, procession and stay away from the grave. For the rabbi, I should emphasize, law and custom were one and the same. He adamantly refused to violate either, and the grieving family had to give in. Rosie is a strong woman, but at the moment of burying her beloved father, she felt incapable of challenging the rabbi. 
The father was buried without his daughter publicly saying the last farewell. This is an illustration of the power of patriarchy. Men like the rabbi, and he represents a large camp, uh, do understand that women are challenging the prevailing order. And these men are willing to do anything to prevent this from happening. What this story illustrates is that the state of Israel, in the state of Israel, Orthodox men have great difficulty accepting the notion of gender equality. I shall return to this point momentarily. Meanwhile, secular men and women, as well as men and women who observe religion but reject orthodoxy, are engaged in finding words to enforce gender equality within the religious framework. This is not about ending men, but rather about ending the rule of orthodoxy, which does not recognize women as full citizens of their community. One of the social uh, uh, organizations active in improving the status of women in Israel in this area is IRAC, Israel Religious Action Center. IRAC is a social movement. It fights the spreading phenomena of gender segregation in buses and in other public places in Israel through education, protest, lobbying, and litigation. Note, and this is important for the comparative argument, that IRAC is supported by the Reform Jewish movement in the United States, and that it is rather influenced by American feminism and by the civil rights movement. American Jews, men and women, feel that they have a stake in this matter and join the struggle. With the help of IRAC, Rosie filed a lawsuit in the small claims court in the town of Be'er Sheba, Be'er Sheba, as you probably uh, recognize. She was one of, the, uh, of many grassroots plaintiffs who sue institutions and persons who discriminate against women. In other words, in 2012, we witnessed a mighty struggle. The Orthodox wished to enforce patriarchy in the name of loyalty to Jewish law. In response to the call for gender equality, they invent, invent more and more programs rooted in traditional Jewish law that segregate women. Against them stand the progressive camp. Rosie's argument in her lawsuit was that the rabbi's action was in violation of the Israeli public accommodations law. Rosie won her case. The burial society was ordered to pay her a modest compensation for the aggravation that she suffered. All over Israel today, more and more such secular women insist that they are entitled to partake in the funeral service. And more and more rabbis are willing to interpret Jewish law as permitting a limited measure of female participation in the last stage of a person's life. But I do not see that as a, as that as a single signal of the end of men. To the contrary, the more women insist on equality, the more some in the Orthodox community, men and women, feel threatened and violated, and therefore insist on ever more segregationist, segregationist practices that will remove women from the public sphere. It is important to understand that for many Orthodox Jews, the idea of the end of men is heresy, a violation of the command of God. I submit that an Orthodox version of, in, of most religions Islam, Catholicism, whatever, reflects the same patterns for the obvious reason that most religions are based on patriarchy. Marianne Keynes discussing the status of women in, in the Catholic Church and Shahla Ha'eri discussing the status of women in Islam uh, or the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, will further uh, elaborate on this similarity. Orthodox Jewish law comes into conflict with secular law, particularly in regimes which do not adhere to a strict separation of church and state. Israel has a good set of secular laws which uphold gender equality. Much progress has been made in the area of gender equality since the 70s. But Orthodox Jews, men and women, perceive this progress as a violation of God's law. They try to set the clock back through, the, through political pressure, social movement activities, and sheer physical force, otherwise known as violence. In the state of Israel, the Orthodox uh, have considerable uh, political power. Hence, it could be expected that at the end of the day, they will make mild gains that may be reflected in secular law. In my paper, I show how this matter is related to diaspora Jewry, particularly to American Jews. In the American Orthodox Jewish community, we see a movement called JOFA, Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance. This movement develops a variety of projects demonstrating that Jewish law need not be interpreted as discriminatory against women. It tries to bring changes from within the framework of Jewish law. Jofa encounters both sympathy and harsh opposition. Most American Jews are secular. 
and in the United States, the reform and conservative movements are quite strong. They have long accepted the equality of women. In the United States, it is rather easy to reject orthodox effort to re restore gender-based segregation in the public sphere. Um, a, because American secular law stands by the progressive religious camp and above religious law in the public sphere. The pro-gender equality camp support grassroots civic organization in Israel fighting against the orthodox campaign to promote gender-based segregation. The civic organizations, in turn, use the means historically developed in the United States to achieve gender equality in Israel, litigation, lobbying, and education to defend the notion of gender-based equality. When we examine all of these groups, we see both men and women working together, supporting, assisting, and encouraging women to insist that Jewish law need not be interpreted as discriminatory, but rather it can be interpreted as compatible with feminist notions of gender equality. This is an uphill battle because the Orthodox Jews reject the notion of the social construction of reality, believing that God's law, which they claim to speak for, is independent of history. They reject feminist theory as sheer arrogance, this is a religious term, against the will of God. I could also add that for the Orthodox, the specter of women going out to work is neither new nor threatening. They encourage women to work so that their husbands can pursue the supreme life activity, learning. Thus, a finding that more women join the workforce, even that they do well in the workforce, is irrelevant. Men still decide the limits and contours of their activities. The notion of the end of men, even in a slogan, is therefore counterproductive. In an orthodox world which denies the social construction of reality, it cannot be accepted and calls, calls for a counter-revolution aimed at defending God. Going back to Rosie and to Iraq, they defended her, the end of men is not what they mean to achieve either. Rather, they want equal protection under the secular law, which will go hand in hand with the restoration of the biblical notion shared by all Western religions that God created both male and female as equal in his or her image. Thank you. <laughs> so I can now call on Miriam, Professor Miriam Case, and you can choose what you want to do. I am going to speak from here because I'm not going to use PowerPoint, but I've got a series of old-fashioned visuals aids that I'm going to hold up and point to as the time comes. And, um, Benita said that I was going to be talking about uh, religious law. I want to be clear, I understand, you know, because I did not present a paper to her in advance, but only my project. I'm not at all going to be talking uh, about religious law. I'm going to be talking about religious attempts to influence secular law. Uh, in particular, the Vatican's longstanding allergy to the English word gender when used in a variety of sec secular law and social contexts from uh, the Beijing Women's Conference to um, the EU and nations within it uh, and, uh, and around the world. Uh, and this is a, a small part, what I'm presenting here, of a much larger project. My first visual aid is uh, a small piece of this has already been published in the Pace Law Review uh, under the title, After Gender, the Destruction of Man, the Vatican's Nightmare Vision of the Gender Agenda for Law. So given that this article was well in process when Linda first contacted me about participating in this conference, you will understand that with all due respect to Hannah Rosen, I did not understand at all that this, the End of Men conference was about a, a, a particular book and project. Uh, the title of my paper uh, is, uh, Does the End of Men uh, it, so so the, not, the, the claim about evaluating uh, claims about the end of men, the claim I'm considering is, does the end of men mean the end of man? Uh, and the Pope says, yes, it does, and I'll get to that uh, in a moment. And I see myself as part of this much bigger project, you know, eventually a book-length project, uh, to be following in the Linda McLean uh, tradition 
of uh, opposition research, if you want to call it, in this uh, election season, getting really deeply uh, involved in the arguments that people who normatively have exactly the opposite position from me uh, are engaged in. But one of the things I find fascinating is that although normatively the Pope and I, like Scalia and I, do not agree on much, descriptively we connect the dots in the same way. The only difference is their dreams are my nightmares and vice versa, but we see the same things when we close our eyes. So what I see is connections between uh, sex you know, all of the new secular law changes around the world in sex, gender, sexuality, and the family, and so does the Pope. I will get to that in a, in a moment. And the people on my side tend to uh, be in what uh, Ali Miller has taught me to call silos, right? There's the uh, sexual orientation and gender identity silo, there's the reproductive rights silo, there's the women's rights silo, and so on down the line. So, I said I'm not going to be talking uh, about religious law at all. Part of the reason for that is that a, an, another large part of my project is to demonstrate that what the Vatican is now saying, it's and therefore the natural, human, and correct view of gender relations is, um, is new to the Catholic Church. I was brought up Catholic in single-sex schools in part. and. Um, that's what made me a sameness feminist. Uh, I've written about this. So I am, my, my audio, my visual here is, <laughs> yeah, this is from the Sistine ceiling in, as it happens, the Vatican. It's the creation of man, Adam, to go to the Hebrew. So is it the creation of man or is it the creation of the male, right? So, so two ways of reading this shirt on me. One is that, um, <laughs> what's depicted and what's inside is the same, right? I am embodying, you know, his breast is over my breast, or I'm Eve still inside, waiting to come out, okay? And my sense of the Catholic and the canon law, if somebody wants to ask me about that tradition from the Middle Ages on down, is that it is more in tune with what the Pope now says is the gender agenda than it is with what the Vatican now stands for, which is a notion of complementarity. Uh, and to talk about it, this notion of complementarity, the yin and yang uh, of the sexes, uh, and to essentialize that, very odd for Catholics, came to Catholicism in the mid 20th century through a married Protestant convert important married, important Protestant, right? And also, we talk about the end of men here. This is really uh, also a story about the beginning of men, right? So Thomas Lecure's um, invention of sex may play a role here. Uh, the, you know, the notion that the sexes are radically and essentially different, he argues, and I didn't really see that argument have traction until I started looking at the Vatican on complementarity, is a uh, modern invention, uh, you know, 19th through the 20th century. Uh, in, enough of that, and, and back to um, the uh, theme of, uh, of the end of men uh, and its relation to the end of man. So two things that always get said uh, erroneously about Pope is Pope is allergic to Judith Butler, and that's where he's getting it all. Clearly the Pope is allergic to Judith Butler, but he's equally and more specifically allergic to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and it's her use of the term gender, that is to say, uh, indistinguishably with sex, that is the legal framework, but it is interestingly, although diametrically, definitionally opposite, conceptually quite similar to the women's studies conception of gender as the socio-cultural overlay on the underlying biological sex distinction. So one, sex and gender are linguistically or you know, definitionally the same, the other sex and gender are linguistically different, but they all amount to a plasticity, not just plastic woman, but plastic humanity. Um, and so I'm also wearing my little human bracelet um, and the skulls that the Pope thinks will follow the death. Uh, he, I mean, I, I, in, in, in the in the Hoster paper, I uh, compare. I said that the Pope reminded me of nothing so much as the Charlton Heston character in Planet of the Apes, saying, "You maniacs, you blew it all up. God damn you. God damn you all to hell." Um, and I, I I wasn't being snide about that. I was being quite serious. So. Another sort of misrepresentation or you know, narrowing of the Pope's vision and of the Vatican's vision, both Popes separately uh, as uh, individual theologians and philosophers, John Paul II and uh, 
Joseph Ratzinger, now Benedict XVI, had this as part of their agenda well before uh, they became pope. Uh, Ratzinger's been talking about this since at least the Ratzinger Report in 1985. Um, and he gave a speech to, uh, a Christmas speech to the Roman Curia a couple of years ago for which the uh, headlines in the English press were, Pope says heterosexuality endangered like the rainforest. <laughs> well, it, and, and made it all about, you know, Pope's opposed to gays and trans people. He is, clearly, but um, also opposed to feminists. And he, you know, uh, talks about this. So let me read you from, from these remarks what I mean when I say, you know, does the end of man lead to the end of man? Um, he, he has long had this view of human ecology, right? That there is a human ecology just like there is a natural ecology of other flora and fauna. And he says, we have a responsibility towards creation and must publicly assert this responsibility. Uh, not only defend earth, water, and air as gifts of creation belonging to all, must also protect man from self-destruction. Um, and he was speaking in Italian, and in Italian there's no distinction uh, between uh, uomo is the word both for male and for human being. Uh, he was not speaking in his native German, where there is a distinction between the two words, mensch and mann, and we'll get to that later because I'm going to come to Germany if I don't run out of time. Uh, so what is needed is something like a human ecology correctly understood. If this church speaks of the nature of the human being as man and woman and demands that this order of creation be respected, this is not some antiquated metaphysics. What is involved here is faith in the creator and readiness to listen to the language of creation. To disregard this would be the self-destruction of man himself. Uh, and what is often understood by the term gender, and the term gender appears in English in the original Italian speech, ultimately ends up being man's attempt at self-emancipation from creation and the creator. Man wants to be his own master and alone, always and exclusively to determine everything that concerns him, yet in this way he lives in opposition to the truth. Rainforests deserve indeed to be protected, but no less so does man, a creature having an innate message which does not contradict our freedom, but is instead its very pre uh, uh, premise. So earlier he talks about how feminism is what gave people the idea that they could be anything they wanted to be and that this has a certain intrinsic appeal at first glance, but when you think about it, really serious dangers. And he is presenting in this uh, way as what he calls, uh, as a re representative of the church, as what he calls an expert in humanity. Okay, so let me, uh, in the uh, few minutes I have left, talk a little bit about how this plays itself out in two countries in uh, Europe in which I do comparative law work, uh, France and Germany. We'll hear from Julie Suk about uh, some of the French work with parité, which the Pope is all for because, um, or not the Pope, the, the, the Vatican messengers are for because it uh, speaks to this notion of complementarity. But a whole lot of the rest of the simultaneous changes in French law, for example, the institution of the Pax, the Pact for uh, Civil Solidarity, uh, in any reform of family law, and even uh, the inclusion, and this was something that uh, about 80 deputies of Sarkozy's party under Catholic influence uh, demanded the immediate withdrawal of all newly issued middle school biology textbooks uh, last year because they contained reference to the notion that uh, masculinity and femininity were in part social constructions. Uh, that is to say, to the evil gender theory and the evil gender agenda. Um, and for people who do comparative law, um, note that this, because in the United States we've developed a constitutional law that takes this off the table as an argument in uh, secular law, uh, American critics of uh, things like same-sex marriage don't tend to use these uh, arguments. And French critics, both from within the Catholic Church, like my personal favorite, the Lacanian psychoanalyst priest Tony Anatrella, who uh, immediately came out with a pocket version of a 900-page uh, uh, previously issued uh, book on contested terms uh, concerning the family. Uh, that the Vatican had produced to back up these 80 deputies who said we should withdraw the, the textbooks, and also goes around the world to Africa, uh, to uh, South America, talking up against the use of the term gender and talking up the instantiation of complementarity in secular law. Note the new Tunisian constitution now suggests that uh, woman is complementary to men. Uh, this has created a big brouhaha among um, Tunisian uh, feminists who, yeah. Anyway, uh, 
Um, so there are lots of objections in, um, let me hold up my show and tell. Uh, we've got Menschenen, the German word for human being, followed by a female modifier, and you see a, um, a, a woman in a skirt and high heels doing road work, construction work. The author of this book is uh, the Austrian candidate from Jörg Haider's party for president. Uh, I don't want to cast uh, aspersions. Um, <laughs> I don't. Um, but a whole lot of other people are objecting under, through, through the perfectly reasonable term gender mainstreaming as indicative of this terrible uh, agenda. But then on the other side, we've got um, reason to think that the Germans are questioning, like the French, the notion uh, of the differences between the sexes. Now, the French, uh, even who, those who do not identify as Catholics, uh, are seriously contemplate the notion that the Vatican promotes, which is that if we removed all gender distinctions from the law, then kids would grow up psychotic. Because sex distinctions are what enables human reasoning. Um, in Germany, we've got, however, anxieties about masculinity uh, and the Green Party's promotion of a new man under the heading, we want a new man, we don't want to have to be machos any longer, uh, you know, we are not uh, born men, but we are made into men, you know, quoting Simone de Beauvoir. And uh, I'll end with, without even translating, um, Germany, German is a language with many fewer words than English. There are literally dozens of words in German to describe various aspects of this new man, mostly critical words, not friendly words, but some of them. So, Frauenversteher, Warmduscher, Abspüler, Leihvater, Weichei, Sitzpinkler, Rosinenmann, Schmerzenmann, uh, unsicherer Mann, unbestimmter Mann, formbarer Mann. <laughs> I could go on, but I won't because I'm out of time. Okay, next we have uh, Professor Shahla Ha'eri. Shahla, you want to go? Um, I, either one. Which one is more comfortable? You want. Um, it's your choice. I think I'll just sit there. Your yeah. I'm a bit, yeah. Um, I think maybe I'll just sit over here, and okay. uh, it's hard to follow that <laughs> wonderful uh, presentations. And thank you, um, Penina, and thank you, Professor Linda McLean, for <coughs> organizing such wonderful conference, and I'm really sure very pleased to be part of it. Um, and it's really nice to have after Judaism and Christianity and Islam, you know, like um, we're just right all there. Um, I call my paper No End Inside Paradox Politics and Gender Policies in Iran. When I heard of the end of men as a topic of a conference, I chuckled. What end of men, I thought, reflecting intuitively back on Iran where I was born. In the face of it, it appears to be more like the end of women if we must look for an end, particularly since 1980 and the establishment of the puritanical Islamic Republic of Iran. Could it be that appearance betrays much more complex and complicated realities of the state policies of roles and lives of men and women and their evolving relationships? The religious state that was established in the aftermath of Iranian revolution of 1979 resolutely aimed to reverse the presumably decadent westernizing and secularizing trends initiated by the former Pahlavi Shahs. Chief among them was gender roles and their associations in the public domain and the religious state that the religious state perceived as immoral and sinful. Towards engineering an Islamic moral order, the state imposed strict rules of modesty on women, criminalized unveiling in public domain, and punished women who dared to disobey the law. The very same law, the very same veil that not long ago had been forcibly removed by Reza Shah and punished women who dared to wear it in public. Simultaneously, the regime sought to reframe the culturally stigmatized and traditionally marginalized temporary marriage. Billing it now as a brilliant law of Islam, that is Shi Islam, the often private and verbal contract of temporary marriage that could be 
as short as one day to as long as 99 years, was argued to be a legal way to satisfy sexual desires and so a moral substitute for the sinful Western style free relationship between the sexes. How is it that the Islamic Republic aims to segregate the sexes, impose veiling, yet insist on implementing a form of sexual union, halal sex as some would call it, that by and large has been rejected by the public? I believe here lies the crux of Islamic Republic's paradoxical policies that while resulting in profound changes in gender roles, expectations and experiences have increasingly confronted the state with unintended consequences, some of which are antithetical to the original policies. 30, 33 years into the establishment of Islamic Republic, let us consider very briefly where women stand, very briefly, where women stand as their education, employment, poli uh, political participation, and legal rights are concerned. The politically persuasive calls to women to come into the public domain and protest against the Shah, most vociferously articulated by Ayatollah Khomeini, did much to break the old religious taboos, open new vistas for women, and raise their consciousness. With his blessing, the Islamic Republic embarked on a national literacy campaign and actively pursued education for women. Many conservative families who had refused or were reluctant to send their daughters to schools under the Shah's government now welcomed the new opportunity and willingly did so, believing in the Islamic moral character and policies of the state. Let me give you a few statistics. By 2010, the overall rates of girls' literacy had claimed, climbed up to 85.5% for women, 922 for men, though the rate of girls' literacy was much higher in the urban centers such as Tehran reaching as high as 97%. So Iran is not a Taliban you know, um, society. Similar to the educational trend in the US as cited by Hannah Rosen, college-aged Iranian women have systematically outperformed their male counterparts to the point that by 2009, women constituted 64% of college student body. In the words of the editor of the Women's Legal Rights, Rugge Zanon, Women have conquered one of the men's biggest stronghold, namely colleges and universities. This is all the more impressive when we consider the fact that in Iran, for young people to get into college, it's not enough to have money and talent. Women and men all must sit for a grueling entrance examinations locally known as concours. The higher the score, the better chances of getting into universities in cities of one's choice. The entrance examination is gender blind, as it is class blind and color blind. Not only women have systematically scored higher than men, they have often won the top spots for various national and international math and science Olympiads. On the other hand, millions of women were pushed out of their jobs and employment opportunities were heavily restricted or curtailed after revolution because it would put the genders in the same space or in close proximity. But the irony of gender segregation is that, quote, it created a great need for female labor in different sectors of the economy, particularly in education and health, end of quote. Further, the post-war economic necessities forced the state to overcome its initial oppositions and to absorb women into the economic sectors. For millions of families, it was no longer possible to have men as the sole breadwinner i.e. women whose husbands were thrown out of their prestigious jobs because of their associations with the Pahlavi regimes, or women whose husbands or other breadwinners were on the battlefront fighting Iraqi soldiers had been maimed or already martyred. In either situation, women seemed to adopt more easily and readily to the loss of their male breadwinners or his luc lucrative income, and similar to Rosen's argument. Presently, women have a slight edge in employment in the service sector, that is to say 48.1% for women to 47% for men, and women have found the uh, 
service sector a much more hospitable place to work in. Politically, while lauding the highest status of women in Islam, the Islamic State dismantled the Family Protection Law of 1967, rolled back modest legal improvements in women's status, and reinstated restrictive and legal, a literal version of Sharia, this is Shi'i Sharia law. Iranian women are, of course, monolithic, neither in their ethnicity and class, nor in their aspirations, discourses, or objectives. What applies to all uniformly, however, is the personal law. That is to say, regardless of their socioeconomic status and professional achievements, women must secure their husband's written permission in order to leave the country. You know, if they want to leave the country, they have to get his permission, or automatically lose the custody of their children at the age of seven in case of divorce. Hannah Rosen writes, quote, the post-industrial economy is indifferent to men's size and strength. The attributes that are most valuable today, that is to say social intelligence, open communication, and the ability to sit still and focus are at a minimum not predominantly male, end of quote. Using a similar logic, one of the women presidential contenders I interviewed in Iran during the presidential election of 2001 argued that knowledge, intelligence, and know-how are the most important prerequisites for leadership, not men's strength of his arms. Both men and women, she argued, have intelligence and wisdoms. So why can't women become president of Islamic Republic of Iran? But this woman, along with 47 other women who had nominated themselves for the office of presidency in 2001, was ultimately unable to break the glass ceiling and occupy the office of the president of Islamic Republic. They were all disqualified by the Guardian Council, that is, exclusively male institutions. While no end may be in sight for either gender in Iran, we may note deep sociopolitical anxieties associated with changes in men's and women's roles after revolution and its subsequent Islamization. Women's higher education and the awakening has led to higher age for women's first marriage, increased rate of divorce, and individual dissatisfaction with the state restrictive family and oppressive policies. The state public advocacy of temporary marriage and its acknowledgement of unavoidability of youth sexuality, in fact, made premarital relations more common, and I'm almost done, particularly among the middle class, regardless of the form it may take. By mid-2000, the increase in educational imbalance between the genders and women's increasing economic empowerment became alarming to the political elite particularly causing concern and consternations among the religious establishment. One ayatollah or another would use the Friday pulpit to warn of the dire consequences of women's higher education, accusing educated women of unwillingness to marry, to be demanding of high bride prices, to having unreasonable expectations to be quick at filing divorce, and so dis disturbing God godly mandated family hierarchy and gender relations. In 2008, a bill was sent to the parliament intending to remove <coughs> the slightest restriction <coughs> excuse me, on men's rights to contract plural marriages, whether a temporary or permanent kind. Um, so I'm just going to end by this comment. Surprised by the result of some of its own supportive policies on education, the state is changing the tactics by restricting women's access to higher education. Just last year, women were barred from majoring in some 70 disciplines and fields. Faced with many women's and their families' objections, the presidents put the blame on various universities and individual policies, never mind that it all appeared to be well coordinated. Women's gradual and steady performance, in short, has created deep anxieties for the ruling elite. Some have an inkling of the erosion of their power and so exert their political and legal authority ever more strictly. They have not missed a chance to blame every social malady on women, from the collapse of Iranian money last week to the devastating earthquake of a couple of years back that was said without a hint of irony that was caused by women's bad veiling and impious behavior. Thank you.
Thank you, Shala. And now we move to uh, Fenula Ni Eloin. So now, as Monty Python would say, to something completely different. Um, I'm going to talk about um, terrorism and counter-terrorism discourses. And in particular, what I, the title of my paper uh, calls The Persistence of Men in These Discourses and Spaces and the Peripheral Presence of Women. Um, so there's an obvious point, of course, that terrorism and counter-terrorism practices and discourses are not new. Uh, but post 9-11, the preoccupation with violent actors uh, has increased particularly for Western states and for the United States uh, most notably so. Um, from a feminist perspective, it's also notable that uh, terrorism and counter-terrorism have long been marginal to the interests of mainstream feminists. Um, I put myself in that category, having spent many years doing what would sort of be classic uh, national security uh, work, uh, but never quite joining the dots between the work, the feminist theory work I was also interested in, and the space of thinking about the state's responses to violent challenges. Um, and what, when we think about the absence of women, uh, the sustained absence of women in these scholarly and policy discourses, um, part of that is, of course, the historical exclusion of women from the war zone, uh, aptly illustrated by Homer's very pithy phrase, quote, that war constituted men killing and men being killed. So I want to do a couple of things in this, in this talk today. One is to sort of cr critically interrogate the notion of what is done in the space. Um, the second is to think about and to challenge the dominant discourses of national security and their exclusion of women, and to think about the way in which women can be made luminal or present in those spaces, but to suggest that when we make them present, when we, quote, really see the work that women both do as violent actors and the state's capacity to regulate the lives of women who find themselves in violent spaces, that is not a simple equation to quote the end of men, meaning that making women luminal is not to prove the phrase that in fact that what they do in those spaces uh, constitutes some fundamental reordering of gender relationships. Um, so it's very clear, um, take any security discourse, whether it's the, um, the, 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 the discourse of executive orders, the discourse of terrorism in general, but torture or rendition specifically, or the passage of legislation, most or many of those security discourses are about in, 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 in reinscribing what are essentially gendered assumptions about the role of men and women in relation to violence. Um, in, part of what drives that, I'm going to suggest, is the absence or presence of women as both violent actors and as victims of violence. And I want to talk a little bit about women as violent actors. And so um, when we imagine the terrorist actor, that actor is largely and uh, overwhelmingly male. And the autonomy of that actor is inscribed as, as one with a male, uh, a, a male capacity. The terrorist actor is also obviously othered. In the United States, um, we think pri primarily of the terrorist actor as the Arab other uh, post 9-11. But in most societies where uh, counter-terrorism discourses predominate, predominate, the terrorist actor is always the raced other, the ethnic other, the religious other, and the actor with capacity in relation to those actor is usually the actor of privilege and circumstances, is overwhelmingly male, and often white, or raced white, or, or privileged in that society. The female perpetrator of violence is is highly absent in the discussions around, um, around terrorist violence. And when that female actor comes in, as we've seen more recently in discourses around female terrorist actors, particularly those associated with the violent politics of extremist jihadi groupings, that female actor is also presumed aberrational. 
She's aberrational in many ways, not merely because she's violent, but also because she's violently fe and female. And that essentialist discourse that presumes that women, A, can't be terrorist actors, but B, when they are, are aberrational in ways that men are not, is one that I think we have to critically interrogate. Because in the traditional narratives, women's contribution to the activation, maintenance, and perpetration of conflict and violence has been vastly underplayed. Various scholarly disciplines, including uh, the one I predominantly work in law, are pervaded by the assumption that women are generally more peaceful, quote, and less aggressive or warlike than men. In the main, then, the uh, qualification and rationale of women's political violence is grossly under-researched across academic disciplines. Um, and the complexity of the space that the female perpetrator offers um, is, deserves particularly, uh, uh, particular attention in part because there's a danger, and those of us who, I, I go to a lot of uh, political science and, and IR conferences, and in the last sort of five or six years, we've seen a sort of a small subgrouping of interest in women perpetrators, but it's a fetishization of the woman perpetrator in a way that I think ought to be deeply discomforting uh, for feminists. Now, there are country-specific examples. My own is probably is the one that's most um, fully filled out in the, in the paper that I, I circulated about women's engagement in ethno-national conflicts, women's engagement as violent actors. But to do that, what we have to do in some sense is to start to break down our assumption of what constitutes action in the space of violence. And so if we narrow down action, to the act of, of committing direct physical acts of violence on another body, we frequently evacuate the female space. What we don't see when we do that is the role of women as collaborators, informers, human shields, recruiters, providers of sexual bait, perpetrators of acts of destruction by means of support, they're the ones who wash the bloody clothes when people come home. They're the ones in Belfast who hid guns under uh, floorboards. Uh, and prams, actually, were a particularly, um, you would, women would walk prams with guns uh, to places where the presumed, uh, uh, their presumed essential femin femininity prevented the state from, quote, seeing them as violent actors. And so there's a couple of, I think, funny things that come out of those observations of both taking apart what constitutes an act of violence or an act of support to violence, which might allow us to see in much more complex ways the range of activities that women do in contributing to violent politics. But it also can have odd effects. And the odd effect is that in the counterterrorism discourses, which primarily challenge men in public spaces about their presumed political and violent acts, in spaces like Northern Ireland, for example, young Catholic men were the primary target. Uh, in Israel, Palestine, young Arab men will be the primary target. Uh, so pick your conflict and pick your minority group, and, and, the, and then you define the men who are most likely to be the subject of attention for counterterrorism strategies. In a, in a position where you make women luminal or presence and you, present and you start to expand the category of acts and activities that constitute violent action against the state, you make them present, but you also make them the targets in a far more obvious way of state, state practices around, um, around counterterrorism. And that is complicated for a number of other reasons, and I want to briefly pause to talk about why that's complicated. One is that because post 9-11, uh, conversations around terrorism have been extraordinarily essentialist. And the capacity to interrogate intellectually or in policy terms the overusage of the term terrorism puts you almost immediately in the category of apologist for violent acts. And most scholars and policymakers find themselves uncomfortable in holding that space. As a result, we have these extraordinarily broad usage, both in terms of legislation and the definition of terrorism, of what constitutes a terrorist act. And the effect of that has been to exclude from the conversation a, a much more complex 
uh, narrative about the causalities of violence in any particular place. It excludes conversations about war of Latin, wars of national liberation. It excludes conversations about occupation. It excludes conversation about the justified use of violence against the state. And I think that conversation means that when we start to, quote, talk about the end of men in terrorism by seeing the presence of women, the, the outcomes may not be the kinds of uh, positive outcomes we assume. One, because they'll make women targets, and that, there's, a set, there's a set of complicated engagements around that. But more so, it fails to do the primary step, which is to examine the category itself which is to think about what is the construct of terrorism and counterterrorism narratives in our societies, and moreover, how we start to attack that essentialist discourse in a way that far more uh, profoundly reveals the complexities and causalities of violence in our societies. Um, the, the second point I'd like to make is to think about, and it's mostly a reflection on some of the conversations of the last day and a half, is this, is this tendency to essentialize the conversation around that the presence of women, uh, in some sense, automatically says something about the end of men. And clearly, as any critique of the sort of liberal feminist mode of presence, meaning more than mere presence, will know, that we shouldn't assume that the presence of women in discourse or practice, in fact, profoundly or in any way fundamentally changes the masculinity of that discourse or the reproduction of patriarchy in the space. And I think the counterterrorism, counterterrorism terrorism narratives provide the, count, the, the sort of the perfect example to prove the point, which is to say, Merely a discourse that merely tells us that women are present in complex and, and, and highly differentiated ways in violent spaces tells us nothing about the masculinity of that space. What we see more often than not is women reproducing the very masculinities that drive the violence in the first place. So that the presence of women is no more nor less than the presence of another sex. It's not fundamentally changing the violent dynamics and may in fact be reproducing them in other ways. Finally, let me just say, I also think the same goes to think about the sort of the patriarchy that constitutes the production and reproduction of violence in most societies. And it is to say that the presence of women reproduces that in ways patriarchy adapts just like violence adapts. And I think we have to be very careful of assuming um, that the mere presence of women is not in fact a working out of a deeper form of patriarchal reinvention than its demise. So I'll pause there. Thank you. So patriarchy is much more uh, plastic than one would uh, <laughs> tend to think initially. So now we are moving to uh, Professor Julie Souk. Uh, presently at Harvard Law School. Julie, what do you prefer? So I'll talk from here. Okay. I'm going to talk about gender quotas after the end of men. And um, I hope uh, Hannah Rosen is pleased that my paper uh, begins by assuming that everything she says about the end of men is correct, that the thesis is correct, that the end of male dominance and fe female subordination has, in fact, come. Uh, but perhaps she'll be disappointed uh, to learn that I'm largely doing so as a law professor's hypothetical. Um, but I think it's an extremely useful one. Um, in fact, about a year ago, I was at a conference on the philosophical foundations of discrimination law, uh, and many of the philosophers, some of whom have published extensively on Kantian uh, ethics and so forth, uh, said, well, to really understand what the principles of gender equality are about, we just have to ask ourselves what we would do um, if uh, men, uh, uh, sorry, if women oppressed men for uh, a few centuries and or men were just the obviously disadvantaged sex, and that would give us a good idea of the principles. Um, and of course, the law professor's hypo is here is useful uh, because uh, there are a lot of indicators um, that suggest that maybe the end of men is near or, or here. Uh, and I want to uh, use this as an opportunity to think about two different models, normative models of gender equality that have come up in the context of debates about gender quotas uh, in Europe. 
uh, because I think that the biggest question really um, raised uh, by the end of men thesis is the normative one. Is this a utopia? That is end of male dominance. Women have good jobs. Women have positions of power. Yay. Uh, so that means this is gender justice, feminist utopia. On the other hand, I think that the thesis is fraught with uh, normative ambivalence, uh, and there are a lot of implications that this is not a utopia from the standpoint of gender justice at all, that it's in fact a new dystopia uh, because men are disadvantaged in the post-industrial economy, and that's something that might require some kind of uh, legal uh, intervention uh, as a moral imperative. Uh, and of course, uh, this sort of raises the question then about, well, is it possible to end uh, women's disadvantage um, without uh, engendering uh, women's dominance? Um, is it possible to neatly d draw the line uh, between disadvantage and um, subordination? Uh, and so uh, to, to get at these questions, I just wanted to take a glimpse at something that is an important discussion in Europe right now. The European Commission is expected this month uh, to uh, propose rules requiring gender quotas in corporate boards of directors. Um, they would most likely be following the formulation that you see in various European countries that have adopted uh, similar corporate board gender quotas, which is to say a rule um, that says that on the boards of directors of public companies or publicly traded companies, uh, what one sex cannot exceed 60% of the directorships. Uh, and Norway has a rule. Norway's not part of the EU, but Norway has had this rule since 2003. Um, it's been very effective in the por corporate boards uh, context. The uh, large percentage, or actually all of uh, the companies to which the Norwegian law applies have come into compliance um, within a very brief uh, five-year period of time. Uh, and uh, there are many other countries very recently, uh, France, Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands, um, that adopted similar corporate board gender quotas just in the last uh, two years. Uh, and uh, what's interesting about this development is that in many of these countries that I've mentioned, um, and I focus on France as the example, but France and Italy, uh, there, uh, the, the adoption of gender quotas has been a 30-year uh, struggle. Um, that is initially um, when the idea of gender quotas was first introduced, not in the corporate context, but in the context of um, elected office. Uh, they were struck down uh, by the constitutional courts of these countries as incompatible with uh, constitutional equal protection clauses, or in France in particular, it wasn't just um, an equality guarantee, uh, but constitutional uh, provisions declaring that um, sovereignty is indivisible and the electorate cannot be uh, divided. Uh, and so initially, uh, the whole idea of gender quotas, and specifically the one that was struck down in France in 1982, um, required 25% um, of the positions, or, or rather, uh, a rule that said you can't exceed 75% of one gender, which essentially in practical terms meant you had to have at least 25% women uh, on um, the list for certain municipal elections. And it was struck down because it was an impermissible uh, violation of the indivisibility um, of the republic. Uh, and traditionally, the understanding of gender quotas in this context, and I would argue in the European context generally, if you look at um, in the employment uh, cases uh, of the European Court of Justice, uh, gender quotas are justified as positive action measures um, designed to uh, offset the disadvantage of women. Uh, and they have to be narrowly tailored in some of the same ways that affirmative action programs have to be narrowly tailored in the United States. Uh, but the point here is that they've always been understood as a way of um, eradicating women's disadvantage or helping a disadvantaged group. Uh, at, but uh, and certainly part of the reason the Constitutional Council in France struck, out, struck down the initial 25% quota was that it was divisive because women were seen as a kind of special interest group that, need, that had certain disadvantages uh, and um, were being helped by the law. And that seemed to go against this idea of the universality and indivisibility of the republic. Uh, and the new uh, discourse that emerged in France and ultimately was very successful in precipitating constitutional amendments that eventually led to the adoption of an electoral parity law uh, and then more constitutional amendments that allowed the adoption of the corporate board gender parity law more recently, uh, the new discourse really tried to shift from depicting women as a disadvantaged group towards depicting women as half of humanity, 
Uh, and so a very important shift was that the new gender quotas that emerged in the 90s were not 25% quotas, but pretty much 50-50 quotas. I mean, they're technically framed as 40-60 quotas now, and that's just to leave a tiny bit of wiggle room for odd numbers uh, and things of that sort. Uh, but really, these are gender parity rather than gender quotas, uh, even though they are quotas. Um, but the idea of parity is um, it's no longer divisive because uh, the, the republic remains universal. Um, the republic has to represent everyone in order to be democratically legitimate. Um, it cannot exclude half of humanity. Uh, and there's a fundamental assertion uh, that um, all people are gendered, and they've always been gendered, and there are only two genders. Uh, and in fact, gender is not even the right word. Um, there are men and there are women. Uh, and indeed, the constitutional amendments that paved the way for parity say nothing about gender. They say equal access by men and women. And certainly gender equality is talked about very often in the European context, not so much as gender equality, but equality between men and women. Uh, and so this new discourse um, is really the idea that the democratic state can't be legitimate unless both halves of humanity are equally represented. And so it's, and there are important ways, which I won't go into in the interest of time, there are important ways in which it converges with an anti-subordination, alleviate women's disadvantage narrative, but there are important ways in which it's a totally new discourse. That is, it's assumed that if you were to exceed 60%, that is, if women were to be 70% of the electorate or corporate boards, that would be as offensive or as problematic from the standpoint of this idea of two gendered halves complementing each other um, as uh, a situation in which men are overrepresented. Uh, so that's the, and, and I think that this, what, what I'll call the French and po possibly continental European model is one, is a discourse that has become very, very powerful um, and has uh, become appealing to a broad range of political actors, not just the socialists who started talk about parity, but to some right-wing parties as well. Uh, that, but the idea of women being half of humanity and gender parity being a permanent feature of any legitimate institution um, has become a very powerful one that has motored uh, the whole gender parity movement. Uh, and um, this can be contrasted, though, with some uh, other developments that are going on in the Swedish context. That is, in Sweden, um, over the last uh, 10 years, there have been uh, gender quotas used at the university level that were conceptualized as positive action measures to uh, combat the disadvantage of women. That is, there is a lot of gender segregation in the la labor market um, and some understanding uh, that women were not going into, say, scientific disciplines. So many universities just decided with their admissions to do half-half, like women and men, uh, in their uh, admissions to their programs. Uh, and more very recently, though, these quotas have been challenged. And what's new about these challenges is they're not being challenged by, by men who are claiming to be disadvantaged by these programs, but they're being challenged by women uh, because Sweden is a context in which um, because all the admissions are based on numbers rather than essays or interviews, um, it's pretty clear uh, what's been happening in terms of the numbers. Women basically to get into some programs uh, need to have much higher grades and much higher scores uh, than men to get into those same programs. Um, and in the context of those uh, programs, uh, many uh, lawsuits were brought just in the last few years. Uh, and, um, and of course, the Swedish phenomenon of women outperforming men or girls outperforming boys in high schools and in college admissions tests is not unique to Sweden. There's data that suggests that throughout Europe, women are outper outperforming men in terms of college admissions and even completion of um, university uh, degrees. Uh, but as a result of this litigation, there was legislation in Sweden um, in 2010 to repeal the provision of the higher education law that says uh, that the university should promote gender equality um, or that permits universities to engage in positive action measures of any sort. Um, it seems that there, it, at least in the higher education context, the, the new legislation only applies to higher education uh, and not to corporate boards, uh, but, uh, but at least what's being promoted now is a formal uh, equality conception uh, that gets rid of gender quotas of any sort uh, at the university level. Uh, and, uh, and it's also worth noting that the litigation has, even though it was representing women who were disadvantaged by the quotas and the end of the 
Ending of the quotas has been justified by reference to, well, if they're not needed to help women, uh, they, we, they just should not exist. The litigation actually has been brought by a group called um, Centrum for Right Visa, Center uh, for Justice, um, which very much models itself on um, the Center for Individual Rights and other organizations in the United States that have challenged race-based affirmative action, and in, indeed the earlier projects of this organization was to challenge certain ethnic quotas um, that were operating in the Swedish university context. Uh, but in any case, I think the Swedish model provides a very interesting example of uh, the, an, a glimpse of the end of men future in which we suggest that there's really nothing wrong with gender imbalance or gender disparity as long as it's not the result of gender uh, subordination. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so I, I guess uh, I wrote the paper to invite discussion about which is the model of gender justice that we promote um, as we uh, think about the future of things like anti-discrimination law or gender-based affirmative action in the U.S. context. This is an important question for U.S. law as well because I think uh, Hannah Rosen in her book mentions that many university admissions offices um, start getting really nervous when they uh, when uh, the number of women admitted um, starts tipping over 60%. So that's an informal gender quota uh, that uses similar numbers to what the European uh, uh, organizations are doing. Uh, and so if there are these informal gender quotas operating at the university level, is that sex discrimination? Um, or is it the new gender equality where gender balance is taken to be um, the best way of doing uh, gender equality? Uh, and one thing that I want to suggest, although I, I, I know we're out of time uh, for discussion, is I think if you're going to take the gender balance approach, there might be uh, a different way about it than the uh, essentializing two gendered halves complementing each other way. Uh, and it's what I'm going to call the feminism of fear, borrowing from Judith Sklar's um, essay, The Liberalism of Fear. Uh, and there, uh, I think that when we adopt a gender parity rule or uh, a, a strive to achieve gender balance as a way of doing gender justice, it's a recognition that it's not necessarily a perfect normative ideal of gender justice, uh, but a kind of pragmatic way of uh, preventing uh, disadvantages that we think to be unjust. That is, because in a pluralistic society, there are going to be a lot of disagreements about where to draw the line between gender subordination and gender disadvantage, and because it's difficult as a historical matter to pinpoint the moment at which um, women's disadvantage in the pre-industrial economy uh, got turned into unjust um, subordination in the industrial or end post-industrial economy, although I guess that's what's in question. Uh, but the question is, if we can't draw that line between disadvantage and subordination, might gender balance be the safest, safest if not entirely normatively uh, satisfactory way of doing gender justice uh, in the future? Thank you very much. Okay, so we have some time for discussion. Uh, maybe we will start with the panelists. Anybody would like to engage? I'd like to take questions. Okay, questions. Yes, please. Yeah, the microphone is coming. This is for our middle speaker whose name I'm afraid to try to pronounce. Um, you spoke about um, gender narratives in the those who commit or facilitate terror. And I'm wondering about your thoughts about those who are victims or those who are protectors of victims in those who are experiencing terror. And here I'm thinking of Susan Faludi's book, The Terror Dream, and her argument that our gendered narratives have been really off the mark because of these myths of women always as victims, men always as their protectors. Right, so it's a very timely question and it, I include this in the paper. So clearly one of the essentialized, essentialized discourses we get bo both from conflict discourses, that is discourses of war, as well as the terrorism discourses are about who is the essential or idealized victim. Um, those victims in war are often perpetrated as uh, seen as female, uh, overwhelmingly refugee populations, women as victims of sexual violence, and so on and so forth. 
And I think what that also does is it evacuates conversation about male victimhood in conflict. Um, if we look statistically, the Uppsala uh, conflict database, for example, tracking deaths in armed conflict, of course, men are more likely to die than women. They may die as combatants, although increasingly in conflict situations, the line between combatant and non-combatant is extremely blurry in, in law as well as in practice. So I think that's a very com that there's an ob there's a real obscuring of where the costs lie. There's also a really high cost to women as being the essentialized vic victims of terrorism and or conflict. And I see that most succinctly in the area of international criminal law and sexual ac accountability for sexual crimes, where the quintessential victim is the female victim of sexual violence which there are lots of good reasons why we should think about the woman as a sexual violence victim if she has been, but what that also obscures is the range of other harms that are inflicted on women as well as on men, primarily economic harms, a lack of access to water, food, shelter, displacement. So there's a real, there's a real problem with both ends of the discourses, both the absence of seeing women as perpetrators, but also unpicking that victim group so that we understand more fully the gendered, the gendered breakout of that group, which doesn't neatly fit into categories and is counterproductive actually for women in many ways as being seen as primarily victim victims, removing them both all agency, as well as autonomy then in deciding what happens post-conflict. So there's, there's a relationship between all those things. Thank you. Over there? Was there a question over there? We just need a microphone. I, ha I have a question, it's really for the panel as a whole, about the role of hierarchy, not gender hierarchy, but rather hierarchy in society. So if you see the rise of conservative religious groups, which we are seeing around the world, some of that is also an assertion of a more conservative, more culturally hierarchical set of claims. And on the issue of corporate boards, for example, um, there's certainly a whole criticism that uh, Joan Williams and I both referred to separately yesterday uh, of the dominance of groups that are basically out to make a billion dollars, literally. Um, and the question of whether a more egalitarian ethos in a corporate arena is also part of this. So, um, you know, some of what I was talking about yesterday on the end of men is the rise of elite men often works to the subordination of less powerful men as well as women. And so my question is in the international context, whether it's the issue of the importance of war or conflict, boys with toys, or whether it's an issue about the dominance of international corporations, or whether it is simply about what we call Wall Street greed. Is there something about the discussion we're having about hierarchy that is important to this discussion? Well, I certainly think that the emphasis on corporate boards uh, that is in, there is a natural progression in uh, the European context from talking first about um, elected office and then about corporate boards, largely because corporations are understood uh, to be powerful and therefore perhaps subject to certain social responsibilities. And I'm talking comparatively, compared to the way we think about corporations in the United States, not in absolute terms. Because I think part of the justification for the corporate board quotas is, oh, we think it'll just lead to uh, corporations more mo making more money, the business case. But I think it's actually much more than that. It's some understanding that corporations have to govern themselves uh, legitimately in some of the same ways that the state has to govern legitimately. Uh, and I've written in a little, in, in another context about the ways in which the role of corporations um, in uh, many European countries um, is more sort of formally, the power and the role of, rec uh, of corporations is uh, more formally recognized. And I think, so, th so then the idea that they can't be that hierarchical or at least they have to be somewhat democratic or subject to some understanding of democratic legitimacy then I think kicks in, um, which is why you get an evolution that goes from electoral to corporate uh, in, a, in a kind of neat 
but not entirely neat way, because they did need a separate, in, in France, they needed a separate constitutional amendment to enable the corporate board quotas because the electoral ones weren't thought to apply then. So. Uh, Professor Ailey. Uh, it, it, if I have understood the question uh, that you ask in terms of um, the hierarchy, including, uh, you know, some, uh, making some men inferior in relations to the political elite or legal or religious elite, I think what's interesting uh, to note is happening in Iran is that a lot of men, young men particularly, are becoming very supportive of gender parity, women's rights, changes in the legal structure. So in that sense, it has become even more threatening. So then the, uh, the law and religion is used even more strictly to consolidate the power at the very top and to disenfranchise not just women, but a lot of men too. So I think in that sense, you know, uh, it's a, the question is very well taken. Uh, so can I here? say something yeah. on this? Um, which is not going to be, well, so here's the thing. Taking the two aspects uh, that Ratzinger addressed in his collaboration of men and women in the church and in the world, we talk first about the world and then about the church with respect to hierarchy. With respect to the world, what the Vatican has very interestingly done, and you can see this happening very clearly in Beijing where Marianne Glendon, Harvard law professor, was the Vatican representative, is to set up a, an opposition between first world and elite women who are, have the luxury of caring about such trivialities as um, you know, sexual freedom and um, gay rights, as compared with the Vatican who understands and is reaching poor and third world women where they live, not that they want to have an abortion, but that they want to have a world in which they don't need to have an abortion because they have the economic and social support to bring their children into the world. Um, with respect to the church, that was the world, um, what's happening is that the Vatican is using the, its opposition to the gender agenda to reinscribe the hierarchy of the clergy and the magisterium, which is definitionally all male. You can see that happening in the US with the investigation of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, which I hope will finally um, put the lie to the notion that the Pope is obsessed with homosexuality because radical feminism is one of the things the LCRC is accused of. Um, and you can see that happening in Germany, for example, uh, where there's a, a, a movement, Wir sind Kirche, we are church of the laity. And even in the anti-abortion movement, there is um, the movement Donum Vitae, uh, where it used to be the case that the Catholic Church itself collaborated in the German counseling scheme to try to talk women out of abortions. The Vatican made them step out of it because the end of the counseling is a certificate that allows you to get an abortion if you haven't been convinced. When the lay women tried to take over, the church is now after them. So it's a reinscription of clerical hierarchy and the authority of only the bishops to speak for the church. You can see that same-sex marriage movement in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, June, I would just add two things. I think security discourses, they're meta-discourses. They're ordering discourses and they're hierarchical discourses. They inscribe relationships of power within the state and they can reorder them. Just think about executive, the use of executive powers and, 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 and the ease with which a conversation around security facilitates other reorderings of power within, within democratic polities. So certainly hierarchy here is really important in terms of the capacity of discourse to define hierarchical relationships. I would also say that in the context of co conflict and, and, and individual, obviously membership of, you know, the soldier-citizen relationship is clearly significant to the ordering of membership in the political community in a fundamentally hierarchical way, and that's well-traversed terrain. Less well-traversed terrain is non-state, that is to say the ordering of hierarchy within states that are non-functional. Remember, don't assume a functional state. Assume that in many cases it is the non-state, the, the violent actor, the Sendero Luminoso, the IRA, who are in fact structuring and creating hierarchies within their own community based on the exercise of violent 
power or the capacity to exercise that. So it seems to me it's, it's important both at the meta level in the ordering of legal and political relationships, but literally down to the macro level where it reinscribes structures of power, but, but that are deeply gendered structures they, and, and evacuate the capacity for these other things to come into the space because the discourse of security itself actually has the capacity to move out these other conversations. So. Fascinating. Yes, this will be the last question, please. Okay, um, uh, can uh, you, yeah, just wait for the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. In response to uh, Julie Souk's question, uh, sort of moral question about sh should we, m society, move in the direction of uh, gender uh, equality policies uh, at this time, um, my reaction is no, it's way too premature. Um, we, d we don't want to prevent uh, women and girls from exceeding, say, the success or advance of, of men in, in every subsector of society, right? I, I think just naturally women are going to pro progress in different ways in different subsectors, and only when they're really dominant in, you know, roughly, you know, half the sectors of society, then you might want to think of other actions to take to, to reintroduce more equality across the board. But if women are always bumping their heads up against 50% or even 60% right away, it's, it's, it's just not going to get to the point where even the, um, I think the discussion would become interesting in terms of, well, now women dominate these fields, men are still dominant in these fields, what do we do to, to get equity across the board? So I'd say, you know, maybe in 20 years we'll have this discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Did you want to respond to that? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so yeah, I, I agree with you. That, that is, um, part of what I'm arguing in the paper is that the divergence between what you might call parity, democracy, and anti-subordination, uh, that divergence has been masked for precisely the reasons you cite. That is, if never, nobody thinks the end of men is here, we don't need to talk about whether we like parity, democracy, or anti-subordination, because they'll converge on the proposal that there should be positive discrimination in favor of women, right? Uh, maybe, <laughs> but, um, but, but my question is really, but if we have the conversation now, maybe we'll have a clearer sense of what principles are really at the heart of gender equality. Uh, and it does raise this question about, well, so what do we do in the areas where women are outperforming men like college admissions? Is it actually, is the right thing to do from a gender equality perspective just to let these classes in co-ed schools be 80 or even 90% women? Or do we see that as a problem from our uh, normative ideal of gender equality? Uh, and I think, I mean, so, uh, so one answer is, I think in some contexts we are facing the question. I agree that societally, we may not be facing it for a while, but I think that the way we present the gender equality agenda, imagining what the future could potentially look like if Hannah Rosen is right, is a very useful um, way of uh, elaborating what the uh, ideal of gender justice is. Thank you. So I think that we can proudly say that we added one more terrific panel to this terrific conference, and we will now adjourn for lunch. Thank you. Thank you.